Happy week three, everyone. So we had a little bit, in my opinion, of some denser readings this week regarding the brain and brain function. Um, so hopefully I can help maybe decode a little bit of that, clear that up for you. I'll also be um, focusing a little bit more on the information that's maybe a little bit more pertinent to us as mental health practitioners. So this week we're talking about tools of the psychedelic therapist, pharmacology, neurobiology, phenomenology, um, a little heavy on the neurobiology. Okay, so I tried to order my PowerPoint in a way that makes sense um, to kind of uh, prime us for readings that are coming up. So I'm starting with our um, our article reading on psychedelics and psychedelic assisted therapy. So one of the things that we read about was four different classes of psychedelics. Um, one of the reasons that this is important is because when we when when you hear about psychedelics, you hear them classified. Um, and just the neurotransmitters, the systems that they act upon is really what differentiates them. So in this class, we'll talk um, quite a bit about classic psychedelics, but as you also know, um, and these are, um, these are compounds that act on the serotonin 5H2A receptor agonists. And if y'all remember, agonists essentially increase activity and antagonists decrease or stop activity or reuptake connectivity. Um, and then within classic psychedelics, uh, there's phenethylamines, um, which are organic compounds that um, act as central nervous system stimulants in humans. And then there are tryptamines, which share their core structure with the neurotransmitter serotonin and modulate multiple targets, including 5-H receptors, uh, monoamine transporters and trace amine associated receptors. Uh, tryptamines are a compound of which serotonin is a derivative produced from tryptophan by decarbonyl D <laughs> carb carboxylation. <laughs> um, okay, so classic psychedelic here, um, psilocybin fits here. Um, and pathogens or intactogens, MDMA fits in this designation. Uh, these are mixed serotonin and dopamine reuptake inhibitors and releasers. We talked a lot about that last week in terms of, uh, in many ways, kind of the complementarity of these two uh, receptor systems. Um, dissociative um, anesthetic agents, this is ketamine. Um, and then atypical hallucinogens, which affect multiple neurotransmitter systems. Um, these are things like, to my understanding, like MOA, um, but these uh, atypical hallucinogens are less typically discussed in the literature. So just giving you a little... Um, table here for reference of some different classes and what they, like their primary mechanism of action. So here you can see with classic psychedelics, serotonin, specifically the 2A and 2C receptors, um, intactogens, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine uh, um, um, receptors, and then with dissociative anesthetics, NMDA, it's an NMDA antagonist. Um, and then you can see at the bottom all of the um, um, acronyms and what they stand for. And then you can see the different effects that each of these classes have on cognition, perception, negative emotions, positive emotions, social relatedness, and then other compounds that fit into that class. So you can have this for reference. Okay, so one of the things that was talked about in this article was they referenced another article, um, Nutt and um, Associates did an article or did a study, a review of the literature in many ways and some other uh, mechanisms that they put in this study on um, the 
evaluation of harm of several substances. So as all of you are familiar, if you have done the readings and you have watched my PowerPoints up until now, is that psychedelics have a um, historically have had a narrative of being very dangerous to the point that they were scheduled as a schedule one substance. So in Nutt's study, Nutt and et al's study, they evaluated the harm um, of several substances and um, organized it in a way or had categories about harm to others and harm to self. So in this <clears throat> Um, in this evaluation, you can see here they had overall harm and then they had different criteria for others um, or for users to the self or to others. Um, and so you can, I just wanted to show you kind of the tree of this and I'll get more into the details of this in just a second. So Further, so you can see all the different criteria, like so there's physical criteria, four areas here, psychological, three areas here, social, two areas here, physical and psychological just has one, and then social has six criteria. So here is a breakdown of all of like of the basically the definitions of what they were looking at so when they said like drug specific mortality what did they mean by that when they said environmental damage international damage economic cost what did they mean by that so um there in some ways i think there's some surprising um outcomes of this study because it goes against many of the narratives that we have been, that have been pushed or imposed upon us in terms of the safety or the harm of certain substances. So in the red is harm to others, which was weighted a little bit more heavily, just so everybody knows, than harm to users. So you can see here the weight. So it's out of 100, um, harm to users or harm to self person who uses was weighted 46 out of 100 and harm to others is weighted 54 out of 100. You can see here, psychedelics are way down on the list here with mushrooms being an overall um, harm of six with no harm to others, only harm to self, LSD is a seven, ecstasy is a nine, um, uh, cot as a nine, um, ketamine as a 15. So it's interesting because, for example, here, ketamine is the only legal psychedelic that we have. And then um, alcohol as the legal, most widely available substance that is by far the most harmful substance that we have. Tobacco, another um legal substance is in the top six of the um, evaluated substances. So I think in many ways, this is something also want, something that I share in my chemical dependency class for reflection for the students of, you know, maybe some of the narratives that you have about different substances and their safety, maybe ba based on legal status. Um, you know, are you surprised that alcohol is considered significantly more harmful than heroin or crack cocaine um, who, that are both um, considered more harmful than methamphetamine. So, you know, we just think about the narratives that we are, that are pushed upon us in terms of substances. So just something for your consideration in terms of, again, further, uh, substantiation of my claims that, that, um, psychedelics should not be a schedule one substance. So that's all I really wanted to say regarding that reading. And then we went into Rebus and the um, anarchic brain toward a unified model of the of brain action in psychedelics. So there are essentially two uh, models or hypotheses in some way that uh, constitute this model is the entropic brain hypothesis that this proposes that within upper and lower limits after which consciousness may be lost the entropy of spontaneous brain activity in indexes the informational riches of richness of consciousness states 
or conscious states. So uh, entropy means the lack of order or predictability. So a lot of what was talked about in this article was that our brain is like a computer um, and that we, we, our brain works to be as efficient as possible. So this is very similar in many ways to what we talk about with CBT of like automatic thought processes. Your brain has really automatic pathways that it takes. And part of the, um, for example, the free energy principle framework, this is based on the Bayesian idea of the brain as an in um, inference engine under the free energy principle systems pursue paths of least surprise or equivalently minimize the difference between predictions based on the model of the world and their sense and associated perception. So the Bayesian framework uses metered data to infer the most likely distribution of the modeling parameters. So Bayesian calibration allows for a comprehensive evaluation of measurement errors, modeling input uncertainties, and model discrepancies. So Bayesian, a Bayesian framework, we talk about Bayesian statistics, um, but this is something that can be applied to your brain as well. So basically what this is saying is that the, um, anarchic brain, which is something that follows from the natural liberation of the bottom up signaling, which is logically implied by relaxed precision on priors. So this is all saying that the way our brain, the pathways that it takes, it's like a well-traveled path. And in many ways, it can be limiting to us in terms of our perception, the possibilities. You know, I just think about, for example, as we grow, we become a little bit less creative. Um, we daydream a little bit less. We think outside the box a little bit less. And I think that this can absolutely be socialization. And it can also be, in a way, just kind of how our brain works to be as sufficient as possible or efficient as possible. Um, so it allows for us um, to, well, I'll show you a video in a little bit, but it allows us for us, for example, to not think overtly about how to breathe. So it allows for us to have an internal dialogue. It allows for us to think about things. So there are some things that are in many ways in our subconscious or unconscious. We're not aware of that being at work, but Rebus, uh, which is the, um, I forget what Rebus stands for. I swear I had it somewhere. Oh, sorry. The relaxed beliefs under psychedelics. That's what, that's the acronym for Rebus. Um, and the anarchic brain is the, it's how it, when it's, when the brain is relaxed, it's the, what naturally happens that it naturally follows or a liberation naturally follows, um, this liberation from this bottom up signaling. Um, so basically what it's saying is under the influence of psychedelics, the brain has the ability to create different pathways and have connectivity within the brain of regions that generally don't have connectivity. So that can increase things like creativity, possibilities, insights, imagery, um, all of these things that our brain um, just doesn't naturally do. Also, just for your information on this slide, I did add a link to a YouTube video on um, the Bayesian inference model if you're more if you're interested to learn a little bit more. So in this hypothesis, this model proposes that a principal action of classic psychedelics is to relax the precision weighting of prior beliefs encoded in the spontaneous activity of neural hierarchies. So here it's saying that these precision weighting, so these well-traveled pathways within our brain, it re relaxes that to say like, hey, take a stroll somewhere else, neurotransmitter, make a connection. Um, somewhere else in the brain that you don't normally connect to. Another part is the effect of this relaxation process is felt most profoundly when it occurs at the highest or deepest level of the brain's functional 
architecture. So the levels that insatiate particularly high level models, such as those related to selfhood, identity, or ego. So those parts of the brain that are connected to accessing those parts of us. And then it follows from a hierarchical predictive coding that precise high-level priors or beliefs ordinarily have an important constraining influence on the rest of the hierarchy. So these predictive codings influence the rest of the brain. So it's like kind of the leader and set, tells the rest of the brain, like, fall in line. I have the most efficient way of running. Just do it how I want it. Um, so it, it's there's this constraint on the rest of the hierarchy. And then this canalizes lower components and inhibit in inhibition of their expression and influence. So these lower components are kind of able to flow a little bit more freely throughout the brain. So new pathways. So after taking a substance and the system cools, so when you take a, a substance like a psychedelic, it's considered to heat up the system. But even once it cools, once you are no longer under the um, influence of the substance, and quite frankly, weeks after, it can take days or weeks for the system to fully cool. Um, this may result in the emergence of new energy landscape with revised properties. So meaning different pathways, different ways um, of your brain connecting. So within this transient hot state of a psychedelic experience, so a temporary hot state, there is a flattened landscape that implies that attracting brain states and accompanying brain and the accompanying brain states encoding beliefs are less stable and influential, implying that interstate trans transitions can occur more freely. So instead of this hierarchy, there's a flattening of like, hey, these, these lower um, level um, components are just as influential as some of these higher or deeper level components. Um, and with this flattening of the landscape, there can be increased connectivity along the brain or among the in, within the brain. So under psychedelics, one can view global brain functioning as entering a mode or state that one features a lightening or relaxation of the precision weighting on prior. So all of the this like efficiency input or efficiency um processes, they are dampened, they are discouraged, they are changed in some ways. And this allows for a potentially enduring meaning even after someone is no longer under the influence of psychedelics that it can stay revision of such priors. So these the, these priors actually change the complete way in which the brain connects um, to itself from regions connecting to one another, areas connecting to one another can fundamentally change. And this is through the release of prediction error that impacts on sensitized priors. So again, these prediction um, uh, pathways, these, um, yeah, prediction priors or precision weighting that that can be in some ways kind of, um, overall affected or in some ways kind of neutralized. So I recognize that this is not my area of expertise. So I have pulled in some videos that are hopefully that could be helpful for you. And I'm hoping that these will work. So um, what I want to talk about over these next couple of videos, what I'm going to show you is about the default mode network. Um, the default mode network is very largely, it's the predominant areas of the brain that are discussed when we talk about psychedelics. Um, so I want to teach y'all and give y'all some language about what is a default mode network and what is its purpose um, and how is it affected by psychedelics. Oh. 
Right. So just a little bit about like what the default mode network kind of looks like within the brain. And then here is a, another video on <laughs> uh, the default mode network, also known as autopilot. Hello. In this video, I'm going to look at the brain's autopilot mode the pros and cons of autopilot and how to interrupt it. So let's start by looking at what autopilot is. We spend a lot of our lives in autopilot mode or going through the motions. If you drove your car today, do you remember every gear change, every turn, every time you slow down or sped up? The drive itself was probably a bit of a blur, but somehow you got to your destination. That's because your brain was in autopilot mode. Now, the autopilot mode doesn't just apply to driving. It applies to almost every single thing you do on a regular basis, such as cleaning your teeth, getting dressed in the morning, eating, drinking and exercising, virtually everything you do. Autopilot mode has many advantages. For example, you can engage in a large range of activities without having to really think about it. So by slipping into autopilot mode for routine tasks, you're able to function quickly and efficiently without having to focus on every little detail. Just think about how laborious your day would be if you had to think about how to drive to work, how to catch a train, how to shop for food, how to make a phone call. So as you carry out these everyday tasks, your brain is able to think about other things. So problem solve, reflecting on past experiences and planning for the future. Being in autopilot mode is a little bit like being a passenger on a train and not knowing where it's going. When you get off the train, the emotional landscape can look very different. That's because when in autopilot mode, you become engaged in this constant internal dialogue. And because of this excessive rumination, you can actually easily slip from one emotional state to another and end up quite anxious or depressed without actually knowing how you got there. Functional MRI studies of the brain show that when you are in autopilot, your brain shows consistent activity in regions that are involved with internal thoughts, such as daydreaming, planning future actions, reliving memories, thinking about others and thinking about yourself. Science calls this autopilot mode the default mode network or DMN. Studies have shown that depression and anxiety are associated with hyperconnectivity in the default mode network. Now, since this discovery, researchers started looking for how to calm down the default mode network. Now, what they have actually found is that mindfulness meditation is associated with reduced activation in the default mode network. As it brings you to the present moment, very much the here and now. So you're letting go of the past and future thinking, letting go of this excessive rumination that we spoke about, and just being present. And being present in the here and now really untangles you from this inner dialogue and encourages you to intentionally disengage from autopilot. Research has found that when people took part in an eight-week mindfulness meditation course, 
areas of the brain that are associated with awareness, stress and empathy change. The participants grew new grey matter in their cerebral cortex, which connects to attention and emotional integration. They gained more control of their emotions. They also calmed down their inner voice. So basically shutting down their default mode network. If you're interested in... So for what it's worth, this is a woman who... Um she does work with mindfulness so she's getting a little pitch right now for like subscribing to her page and getting some resources on mindfulness everything that she said in terms of the benefits of mindfulness are also the benefits of psychedelics um so it was it was it's kind of funny i put the link to this uh video in the comments section of this uh slide and someone was like say more about psychedelics. And she was like, that's not my area of expertise, um, but everything. So it was a person that had an experience with psychedelics. And she said, you know, everything that you said makes sense um, in terms of how it may affect the default mode network. So um, there are, <clears throat> there, as you may remember from week one, in many ways with the like indigenous history and some of the ritualistic history with um, psychedelics uh, or any sort of, you know, what has been dubbed plant medicine historically is that there is in many ways like a meditative state. So it's kind of a, a double dose of this awareness and presence. Oops. Oh, wow. What was that? I was oh, $25,000. No. I knew I had to do something. <laughs> That's when I found no. simple and I received a letter in the mail. Always. You no, know, I was pre-approved for a loan. I don't know why that <laughs> also. Okay, here we go again. Okay, just some fun flubs here. Okay, so let's finish up this um, article and what I wanted to say. So as you may remember this week's uh, title is about phenomenology, spirituality, neurobiology. Um, and so here is in some ways, like kind of camps that individuals fall into of, um, you know, there's science behind this. There's a very logical reason why psychedelics work in terms of how they activate the brain. And then other people that are like, it's magic. It's a spiritual connection. Um, like science is, is not necessarily an important part of this. And I'm inviting you to see both of those. Um, so as we know, and as hopefully this class is making sense of how I've ordered it, psychedelics have an interesting history of association with pseudoscience and supernatural belief. Um, I think that that narrative in some ways has been driven by some of the less than ideal methodological approaches that some of the researchers have taken. And then also, quite frankly, many of the um, our, our foundation in terms of the human species with psychedelics had no scientific grounding, I mean, not, not necessarily meaning that the individuals didn't weren't able or didn't have capacity, but that wasn't the purpose. When you think of animism, um, like that, that's supernatural in some ways, this connectivity in terms of our, our fellow animal kingdom type uh, feels in some ways antithetical to science. And it's really not. It's I'm inviting you to think about this both as something that makes sense in terms of in terms of the neurobiology of what is going on in our brain, but then also being open to the spirituality and some of these more supernatural um, in some ways kind of difficult to explain elements of psychedelics. Uh, I think it is meant for both. So one interpretation of this like pseudoscience supernatural belief is that a strong psychedelic experience can cause such an ontological shock. So ontology is the nature of reality that the experiencer feels compelled to reach for some kind of explanation. Humans love explanations. We want to understand what's going on. However, tenuous or however tenuous or fantastical to close an epistemic gap. So epi, 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 epistemology, epistemology, there we go, um, is what counts as knowledge and how knowledge claims are justified. So what is knowledge? So we're closing this epistemic gap 
that the experience has opened up for them. So I need an explanation because my nature of reality has fundamentally changed. So it speaks a little bit to our anxiety of ambiguity as humans as well. Okay, so now moving to our pharmacology of psychedelics uh, chapter. And so here's another video for you. So we've learned a little bit about the default mode network, its purpose. So now I want to show you a video on how psychedelics affect the brain. The default mode network activates when a person is introspective and under normal circumstances becomes less active when a person shifts their attention to the outside world. But brain studies show that under the influence of a psychedelic, the default mode network is quieted, while other regions of the brain increase communication with each other. A mathematical model captures a normal brain's activity. In contrast, a brain under the influence of psilocybin reveals a dramatic increase in global communication. Thousands of new connections form, linking brain regions that don't normally talk to each other. One analogy I've used for how psychedelics work in the brain is the snow globe when you pick up a snow globe, you know, the snow settled at the bottom, it's sort of fixed and then you pick it up, shake it and things jiggle around and there's randomness and a kind of chaos if you want in the system. The user experiences this as an altered and heightened sense of awareness. But what causes this? Early in our functional brain imaging studies of psychedelics, scientists were finding that the default mode network was turning down or turning off during these experiences. And that was a really good place to start. But we began to then look one layer deep. Why was the default mode network turning off? New research led neuroscientist Fred Barrett to investigate a region of the brain called the claustrum. The claustrum is a really thin sheet of gray matter in the brain tucked deep within each of the hemispheres of the brain. Recent animal models have shown that it is incredibly highly connected to just about every other region of the brain, understanding that the receptors targeted by psychedelic drugs are also really densely expressed in the claustrum. We began to wonder whether the claustrum may be at the center of psychedelic effects. Fred believes the claustrum's central location and shape suggests it regulates communication between the departments. When it's functioning normally, the claustrum is essentially acting like a switchboard. It's trying to help other brain regions figure out when to turn on and when to turn off. But when we experience a psychedelic drug, we believe that it's binding to specific receptors in the claustrum and somehow disrupting or disorganizing the claustrum. It's almost as if the switchboard walks away. What happens next is that we seem to observe a, a radical change in the way that brain regions talk to each other. And it may be within this context that we're experiencing learning and a possible even rewiring of the circuits that govern our behavior. And it may be that it's that radical reorganization that allows people to encounter new psychological insights that they hadn't encountered before. Fred thinks the claustrum's sudden abdication of control may help explain why rigid behavior and thought patterns have a shot at resetting. It's almost like they've seen this like kind of grand menu within their mind that they weren't aware of, that this, this greater number of possibilities that they can explore. It took a while to recover. I was having headaches and muscle pains, but it was the best headache I'd ever had in my life because it told me that the psilocybin was working. It was actually physically restructuring my brain, something that I never imagined could happen before. It's like uh, reprogramming the operating system of a computer, getting down to very basic level changes that can enduringly change someone going forward. So 
Sorry, y'all. My computers did something weird. <clears throat> okay. So default mode network. <laughs> this computer. Um, this presentation. Okay. So another area that you heard about is called the colostrum in this video. So there is emerging data across rodent studies that demonstrate that the colostrum is required for optimal cognitive performance and synchronizes distal cortical areas. So when you think of distal cortical areas, we're thinking of like front and back or, you know, northeast, southwest, things like that. And <clears throat> There have, al have also been studies that have suggested that the colostrum is ideally positioned as a modulator that could desynchronize or terminate correlated activation of the default mode at network related areas. So another area of the brain that is being closely looked at is the colostrum um, along with the default mode network, which is ultimately, as we know, regions of the brain because it's connectivity throughout the brain. All right, we're done with videos, so hopefully nothing else will happen here. So in this chapter, we learned a little bit about uh, drug discrimination and understanding the mechanism of action. So a lot of the research that we've been doing on the brain and its connectivity, um, its functioning has been with animals, particularly rodents. So in drug discrimination studies, what they're doing is they are giving rodents um, a specific psychedelic, for example, LSD. And they're observing the rodent to see what is happening um, and, and understanding what's going on, not only with them behaviorally, but in some ways what's going on in their brains. And then there is, um, so they're, they're doing what they can to understand what are the effects of this drug, of this substance. And then what they're doing is then um, so this is what they, what they're doing is, for example, give, when they give LSD to the rodent, they are using that as the quote training drug. So they keep giving this drug to the rodent to, in some ways, kind of habituate some of the behaviors, really make sure that as they're making these observations, that these observations are consistent throughout. Ob so these behaviors are what they're seeing is consistent throughout all of the observations. And then what they're doing is giving chemically similar um, com compounds to the rodents to see, do they act the same? And then if something's different, maybe that is letting us know um, like a, a neurotransmitter or an area of the brain that's being activated by LSD that's not by this, but this is a chemically, the compound is chemically similar to LSD. So therefore LSD must be working on this neurotransmitter or these neurotransmitters. Um, and that can be the mechanism of action for this because it's not working with something like, for example, mescaline, which is chemically similar to LSD. So I'm hoping that makes sense. Um, so yeah, symmetrical substitution occurs when the stimulus of a new drug generalizes to the original training drug, indicating similar pharmacology. So that's also another way to understand pharmacology. Um, so antagonists can help to identify target receptor of the training drug. Remember, antagonists are, uh, they stop the firing of or the reuptake of certain neurotransmitters. So when you put in an antagonist and understand where that antagonist is acting, then that also lets you know where the um, mechanism of action is. Okay, so some clinical pharmacology of psychedelics. As we know, there is a current renewed interest in the last three decades, um, particularly of the therapeutic potential of psychedelics. So we have multiple um, measurements that we are developing that have been developed that probably need some adaptation, all of these fun things um, for assessing the acute effects of psychedelics. So the altered states of consciousness rating scale or the APZ is one that is used to measure the acute clinical effects of psychedelics on this scale. 
It measures three primary dimensions, oceanic boundlessness. Um, one of the effects of psychedelics is feeling this boundlessness of time and space. You're just kind of existing. I don't know what time it is. I don't know how long it's been. Um, many of our participants in the study that I conducted at, or was part of at UAB, um, they would be in their psychedelic experience for like 20 minutes and be like, man, I've been here for hours. Um, and in some ways that indicated to us that maybe they were entering into some, something potentially difficult that they wanted to, um, escape from walk away from. So remember, these are individuals who are addicted to cocaine. What is one of the purposes of substances it is to escape. Um, so they're not used to sitting in some of that discomfort. <clears throat> okay. So Another part is anxious ego dissolution. So if you think of the anxious ego, um, anxiety, worry, rumination, all of these things that can happen to us, if there's some dissolution of that, one of the effects of psychedelics is a sense of euphoria. Um, so that would make sense as a, as a part of the of the experience and then visionary restructuralization, meaning that you're seeing, uh, you're seeing in your visual field, there are things that are, that don't normally happen for one of the kind of classic examples of this is, uh, seeing walls, breathing, uh, floors pulsing as if there were, was a heart in it. Um, seeing geometrical shapes that aren't there, um, not normally or consistently when not under the influence. And then a secondary dimension of the reduction of vigilance. So this is very important, particularly um, in the treatment of PTSD. So if there's a reduction in vigilance, that is meaning that um, areas of the brain like the amygdala are their functionality or um, is, is, hypo affected um so that maybe they're able to talk about an experience <clears throat> in a less um triggered way a less activated way in a in a space that feels safer um where they're not being re-traumatized in some way so that's another ex important example of this so they're also um the studies that have shown that the altered states of consciousness rating scale is sensitive to the effects of psychedelics like psilocybin, DMT, ayahuasca, mescaline, and LSD. So that can be applied to several different psychedelics. Okay. So some more, the hallucinogen rating scale, it's an instrument used to assess the subjective effects of hallucinogens containing six clusters um, somesthesia, affect, perception, cognition, volition, and intensity. Um, so these are meant to see, you know, what is your affect? What is your perception? What's going on with cognition? Um, so just giving you some tools in terms of what is being used to measure some of these states. So the first clinical studies focused on physiology and hormone changes without assessing therapeutic potential. Um, as we know there, that happened in the um, like 60s and 70s kind of when the, or toward the end of the 60s when there was a little bit more of skepticism, fear with psychedelics. Um, and then there were encounters with alien beings and landscapes were reported in higher doses of DMT. So some of those like supernatural connectivities. And then if you think of uh, aliens in any sense of the word, how we use it for extraterrestrial beings, along with human beings on this planet, there's generally not a good um, connotation associated with the word alien. So it just says a little bit about <clears throat> some of the attitude in that. Um, so with OCD, the psilocybin therapy has been shown, has uh, had promising results in reducing OCD symptoms and a small study indicating the need for further investigation and larger trials. That's just so you know, that's going to be the theme of the class. More studies, lar more larger studies applying to more people. And then one of the, um, a study that has been done or several studies um, that have been done in New York and Maryland 
um, are, was giving psilocybin to normal, quote, normal volunteers, because usually you have to have an indication, meaning that there is a um, diagnosable, um, there's a diagnosis that the or that the psychedelic is being applied to in terms of a treatment, such as addiction, PTSD, anxiety, depression. Um, so with normal volunteers, meaning people who don't meet criteria for any sort of diagnosis, they produced per acute perceptual changes, subjective experience, and increased measures of mystical experience. There's another scale to measure mystical experiences, leading to long-term positive changes in attitudes, mood, and behavior. So basically, this is saying psychedelics can be beneficial for people who don't have um, diagnoses. <clears throat> So psilocybin sessions have shown significant increases in openness, which is a personality trait um, associated with aesthetic perception, sensitivity, fantasy, and intellectual engagement. So this openness is uh, seen as a positive trait, and this um, facilitates or encourages that, um, that openness or that, that tendency. Mystical experience and openness, participants who had a complete mystical experience, again, this is a, an assessment to, um, to measure how mystical the experience was. This is one of the measures that we used when I was in Alabama during a high dose session showed significant increases in openness, supporting the role of mystical experience and personality changes. A study combining two psilocybin studies found sustained positive changes in attitude, mood, behavior, and increased rate of interpersonal closeness, gratitude, life, meaning, and spiritual experiences at six months. So there's some um, continuity or some long-term effects. This study that I was a part of, um, that have been a part of in Alabama, did up to a six month follow up. So this will be another, um, you know, we're adding to the literature in terms of some more long term follow up to see how uh, psychedelics have impacted the person. And clinical trials have shown the potential for psychedelics in treating depression, anxiety, addiction to alcohol, and nicotine with therapeutic responses correlated with intensity of psilocybin inducing mystical experience. So we're seeing a, a correlation with some of the more positive outcomes with these diagnoses and how intense the psilocybin induced mystical experience was. So um, that doesn't mean to like take a boatload <laughs> of psilocybin or a boatload of psychedelics. Um, it is carefully measured, um, just for anybody who's interested, it's for every 75 kilograms that the person weighs, it's 25 milligrams of psilocybin. Um, so, you know, we're, we're testing out some of these doses, frequency, things like that. Um, but yes, this does not mean take a, a bunch of psilocybin and things will be better that you, there's only been two ever, um, recorded deaths by overdose of psychedelics. And it was with big, big doses of DMT. Okay. So more clinical pharmacology with terminally ill cancer patients. Uh, this was a study done at NYC, I believe. Clinical trials have demonstrated antidepressant um, effects of psychedelics on patients with terminal cancer. So, uh, um, and antidepressant and some like anti-anxiety effects, uh, where they're just not as afraid of dying. Um, they don't have that, um, fear of dying. There is more acceptance to that. And then just think of that in terms of implications for quality of life. That's, that's pretty huge. Psilocybin assisted therapy has shown promise in disrupting addiction, particularly to alcohol and nicotine. Um, it is currently being applied to all um, diagnosable addictions with the uh, exception of hallucinogens because uh, researchers in this field disagree with that diagnosis being a part of the DSM. Um, so it is being applied. So as you know, in the research that I have been a part of that was applied to cocaine, those, re those results are going to be um, published in the next year. Um, and then it is currently, I think, I believe in Wisconsin being applied to methamphetamines. Um, maybe, uh, no, not, I don't know if it's methamphetamine. I think it's opioids. Um, 
And so just so you know, it's, it's being applied to all, this is a matter of in 2021, when this book was published, which means it was written in like 2020, likely, um, that this information had not been published yet, but, but alcohol and nicotine, I think are two very good foundational, um, addictions to start with because they're the most prominent addictions as well. Um, so we're just seeing, you know, is it applicable to different, um, substances that work on different neurotransmitters that work on different parts of the brain because alcohol and nicotine affect a different, um, parts of the brain than for example, cocaine or opioids. Okay. So correlation with mystical experience, the therapeutic response in studies on anxiety, depression, and addiction are correlated with the intensity of the mystical experience. Um, and then the therapeutic potential of psychedelics in various mental health conditions warrants further research, larger randomized controlled trials to establish their efficacy and safety. Um, I don't know that we'll ever test effectiveness on this because um, efficacy, remember that is in like controlled settings and no one to my knowledge who is researching psychedelics is advocating for recreational use. They can't because they're sponsored by the FDA or, you know, the DEA is part of this. But I think also the, the therapeutic component of this is with some serious control over the set setting, set and setting. Um, I can't remember. I feel like I was going to say something else about this. Oh, with larger randomized controlled trials, that means um, also as you go through the phases of testing a substance that the inclusion criteria get a little bit, or the exclusion criteria become a little bit looser um, so that maybe you are including people with a history, a familial history of um, psychotic disorders, because um, that's been a part that we're not quite sure of. So let's, let's not have them in the studies quite yet because we don't want to give, you know, people who are in positions of power the opportunity to shut this down because they politicize this. Um, so with the larger randomized controlled trials, that usually means a, a, a greater diversity of participants in terms of their um, neurobiology, in terms of their familial history. Um, but that is really strategic, very calculated about how individuals are included in studies. Okay, the mechanism of psychedelic effects on humans. So I wanted to also talk a little bit about um, ketoserin, risperidone, um, risperidone, and um, haloperidol. Um, these are all psychedelic antagonists. Um, so I don't know if, for example, you know how we have, um, shoot, now it's leaving my brain. Um, when somebody is in overdose of an opioid, Narcan or naloxone um, is given to them. I don't know that these are necessarily like that, but I'm just thinking about maybe somebody who is in a psychedelic experience and having like a really tough time. I'm wondering if these could be um, like substances that could be taken in some way to block the effects of the psychedelic. So you can see here, um, uh, risperidone or risperidone is a, has a, and is a complete blocker of psychedelic effect or psilocybin effects and haloperidol is partial. Um, so I'm not sure I just added this to kind of, I don't know, maybe add a layer to the discussion on this of these, um, blockers of psychedelic effects. Okay. So Last chapter, human neuroimaging studies of uh, serotonin, excuse every time, uh, serotonergic uh, psychedelics. Okay, so I wanted to introduce you to um, or, re or review with you some of the neuroimaging that we do um, in research and particularly that's applied to psychedelic studies. So this really goes from top to bottom of um, commonality of use. So functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRIs, by and far um, the most common imaging that we use in psychedelic studies to understand brain um, activity and how it's affected by psychedelics. Then we, has po we have positron emission tomography, a PET scan, um, single photon emission computed tomography, a SPECT scan, 
Okay, let's see if I can do this. Electro and cephalo <laughs> electro and cephalography. That's not it. Um, but an EEG and then a magneto encephalography, um, um, MEG. So EEGs and MEGs are least commonly used. Um, EEGs were historically used because I believe that they preceded fMRIs. Um, as you may be familiar, F in the fMRI is not always used. Um, MRIs, just magnetic resonance imaging, but this functional magnetic resonance imaging is um, what is commonly used now. So uh, psychedelic research in the 1950s and 60s focused a lot on LSD, mescaline, and didn't really focus on psilocybin, DMT, and ayahuasca. Um, I, uh, no, mescaline is still, um, well, it's currently like in the contemporary science is uh, kind of um, neglected in terms of neuroimaging. So what we know a lot about is using EEGs with LSD and it revealed uh, decreased power and scalp oscillations and increased alpha rhythm peak. So some of this stuff might not necessarily make a ton of sense to you, um, which is okay. I'm just kind of letting you know what we're seeing in the different neuroimaging um, EEGs measure, they measure electronic or electric displacement currents generated by synchronized cell assemblies activated at 8, 12 HZ, I've hertz, um, known as the alpha rhythm. Um, so that's what EEGs are, that's what it's measuring. And there is currently a lack of neurophysiological effects uh, or like a, a lack of research on the neurophysiological effects of psychedelic um, phenethylamines like mescaline due to exclusion from neuroimaging studies. And in, um, it's, it's systematic in some way, like there's, it's been, um, what seems like strategically excluded and I'm, I'm, I'm personally not sure why. So limitations in early EEG studies, there was difficulty distinguishing whether LSD and other psychedelics cause fast oscillations due to artifacts of the muscular origin. Um, so just not sure if that was a component of this. Um, larger early studies in cats using um, implanted electrodes found low voltage, fast cortical EEG and associated disorientation from low wave, high voltage EEG, so that the EEG itself negatively affected the subjects. Um, and so human intracranial cranial EEG recordings showed decreases in the alpha rhythm and increased activity in the beta range in specific brain regions. Um, so just understanding um, how, again, it is how psychedelics um, have affected the brain. And then early research tended to view psychedelics as saccato mimetic agents, so mimicking psychopathology and lacked adherence to present ethical guidelines. So in many ways, not super useful to us in our understanding. So modulation of sensory responses and sleep patterns. Early research explored the effects of psychedelics on sensory simulation, stimulation and found alterations in visual, um, in the visual field evoked patient potentials and responses to light flashes. Um, so being affected by that, inconsistent findings were for, reported for the alt, ulnar nerve stimulation, while reduced um, amplitudes of somatosensory and visual responses were observed. Um, for the record, I'm recording this early in the day, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make that my excuse for all of this flubbing or fumbling of words. Um, studies with LSD infusion indicated a shift in EEG patterns from deep sleep to dreaming into REM sleep, the, the second deepest uh, sleep, and suggesting altered states of consciousness. So when you're at REM, rapid eye movement, and then replication of these pioneering studies using contemporary techniques is valuable considering the potential use of psychedelics in brain injury patients. So if we're seeing some of this through early EEG um, and some of that like just older technology, it very well may be use, useful to um, do some updated with um, updated studies with the updated technology.
uh, metabolism and binding affinity in psychedelic research. So pre-fMRI neuroimaging techniques relied on qu quantifying metabolism through cerebral blood flow and glucose consumption. Um, so that's something that is no longer needed with fMRIs. PET scans and SPECT provided insights into neuroanatomical bases of the psychedelic state, offering good anatomical localization, but poor temporal resolution. Um, so we kind of knew where it was coming from, but not really sure, like, in terms of what it actually looks like. Psilocybin studies using PET scans showed increased cerebral metabolic rate of glucose or CMR glue in uh, frontomedial, frontolateral, and uh, temporal medial cortex regions. So just saying where the, the uh, psilocybin is increasing activity, what areas of the brain. And ayahuasca studies with SPEC reported increased activation in the anterior cingulate, frontal, I think it's gyrus, gyrus, um, the amygdala, parahippocampal, gyrus, and anterior insula. Um, so you can see that each of these psychedelics are functioning on different parts or affecting, having an effect on different parts of the brain. All right. Um, so here is really talking about um, in serotonergic psychedelics that that 5-HT2A receptor is the one that is heavily influenced. So that is the one that we know is exclusively affected by psilocybin, um, which is a serotonergic psychedelic because it functions on serotonin, um, but that this 5-HT2A receptor really is what is affected. All right, so fMRI and functional connectivity um, fMRIs provide excellent spatial resolution and acceptable, uh, temporal resolution. Again, I don't know these, what these mean necessarily. Um, like I said before, in terms of the, like about one millimeter about, I'm assuming that that's what that means, the approximately one second. It is the predominant method of functional brain mapping and studying spontaneous brain activity. So you're seeing it in action with an fMRI, um, with an MRI, it's just slices, so you can see uh, it's it's just a different type of of imaging. And so fMRIs indirectly measure brain activity by detecting oxygenated hemoglobin levels in the blood or the bold signal, which is blood oxygen level dependent. Um, it reflects changes in um, hemoglobin driven by localized changes in brain blood flow and blood oxygenation, which are coupled to underlying uh, neural activity by a process termed neurovascular coupling. Um, yeah. Okay, so resting state fMRI and psychedelics. So psychedelic or psilocybin specifically decreased cerebral blood flow in regions associated with the default mode network, which hopefully that has become clear to you. There were there have been changes in cerebral blood flow correlated with the intensity of subjective effects of psilocybin. So that mystical experience, the intensity we're seeing that blood flow is correlated with that. Uh, psychedelics may disengage a reducing valve associated with the default mode network, leading to increased entropy or more randomness of brain activity. So resting state fMRI studies have revealed alterations in functional connectivity with psychedelics. I'm just kind of driving home some of these points. Psilocybin increase the variability and disorder of bold oscillations within the limbic system. Um, so limbic system are most primal, also known as our reptilian brain. Um, so remember, it's this top down effect uh, as influenced by the default mode network. But again, the top, the front and back of the brain are, they both have uses. One is not better than the other. They just have different functions and we're led here. Um, so uh, psychedelics can in, uh, increase some of the bottom up influence, um, which 
uh, in some ways can influence like when participants see like their younger self, you know, they, there's just elements of maybe like, for example, the id, if we're going psychodynamic, um, or if we're going like IFS, some of the exiles, um, that aren't as readily available to us in our consciousness that that can be brought up. Um, psilocybin reduced stability and created a wider range of less stable functional connectivity motifs. Um, that is what entropy is. And it increased functional connect the, the increased functional connectivity was observed between the default mode network and task positive regions under psilocybin and LSD task positive just means like when you're doing a task, the, the cognitions, the energy that is needed when you're doing a task. So the default mode network, when we are like really focused on a task, the default mode network does, um, the activity within it is lessened that autopilot is turned down when we are doing a task. And that's what a task positive region means is like regions of the brain that are activated when we are doing a task. One is not the default mode network. So changes in cognition informed by task-based experiments, psychedelics induce idiosyncratic changes in perception and behavior. That's what an altered state of consciousness means because it primarily affects perception. EEG studies explore the modulation of visual and somatosensory evoked potentials. So we're looking at um, how we're feeling, some of that like kinesthetic um, awareness as well, along with the visual field. And the effects of psychedelics extend beyond the sensory domain into other aspects of cognition. Um, so this is what, what we're talking about when we talk about insight uh, related to the psychedelic experience. Um, okay. Okay, so just some other functional changes here associated with task execution. Um, yeah, so just giving you some points from the reading here. Psychedelics and emotional processing. Psychedelics modulate activation and functional connectivity of the amygdala. This is kind of our risk assessor. Um, so you can, again, see some of the, uh, some of the benefit here, specifically in PTSD work. LSD reduced reactivity of the left amygdala and right medial prefrontal cortex to fearful faces. Um, so again, maybe some ability to talk more freely or be more present in some of those experiences without re-traumatization. Psilocybin decreased threat induced modulation of top down connectivity from the amygdala to the visual cortex. So that fear area or fear assessment to the visual cortex. So reducing threat again, uh, implications for not only PTSD, but potentially some addiction work as well, potentially anxiety. Psilocybin increased amyg amygdala reactivity to positive and neutral stimuli correlating with a positive mood state. Um, so uh, uh, the amygdala not generally being stimulated by that in terms of, um, you know, when we talk about trauma, for example, we generally, and I think our brains very naturally remember fear and negative a lot easier than positive. Um, so this is in some ways flipping that. So future directions, there are two slides left, y'all. Variability in the results across drugs and imaging modalities suggest promising future research opportunities um, to better, like kind of put our finger on what's going on, seeing some of the unique um, aspects of the different psychedelics. Different compounds bind to serotonin receptor subtypes and other neurotransmitter receptors influencing subjective effects. So we know that about... Uh, serotonin and dopamine, for example, with intactogens. And then ayahuasca, for example, affects is has an effect on multiple neurotransmitter receptors. There is uh, limited neuroimaging studies on mescaline, a prototypical psychedelic uh, phenethylamine, um, which warrants further investigation. So that is one of the psychedelics that is just not studied as, not, as much, if you remember that from last week in terms of the percentages of studies that are using different psychedelics, formal comparisons of neural correlates among the psychedelics with different chemical structures and binding profiles are needed. Like I said, um, we're learning quite a bit about serotonin, quite a bit about dopamine by virtue of studying psilocybin and MDMA. 
combined, combined imaging modalities such as EEG fMRI or fMRI and PET scans can uh, overcome limitations and provide valuable insights. So similar to like psycholytic therapy um, and psychedelic and the combination of those two um, potentially having benefits because they, they function differently, combining some of these imaging um, modalities can maybe fill in some of the gaps in our knowledge where, you know, an EEG has a strength or an fMRI has a weakness and vice versa. So let's combine them. Then finally, um, for some more for future research directions, the inf we uh, want to look a little bit more as the influence of contextual factors like setting um, or the environment in which the person takes the substance on psychedelic experiences and neuroimaging um, needs some exploration. We're not um, we're not scanning people <laughs> when they're um, in these cozy rooms. So what I'm curious about what that might look like. A mobile EEG technology advancements enable field recordings in natural settings to capture real world psychedelic use. Um, so that could be some of the effectiveness a bit, but it's still, there's still some control in terms of the guide. Um, but what in particular, we know that there is some real value in taking psychedelics in nature. So what if we took a mobile EEG technology out into nature when somebody was under the effects of psychedelics? That might be pretty interesting to see. Neuroimaging studies can uncover the mechanisms underlying the therapeutic effects of psychedelics. Functional imaging may predict treatment outcomes, reducing costs and regulatory hurdles in clinical research. So just some implications, potential applications here. And then continued research and collaboration across disciplines will deepen our understanding of psychedelic action and potential therapeutic applications. So again, just a door open for more research happening.